Okay, Zaid Dahaj, thanks for coming on to the Regenerative Health Podcast. Thank you for having me, Max. I'm very excited. So you have been posting some very, very interesting threads on Twitter recently that uh, are approaching a bunch of topics, particularly around circadian biology, sunlight, um, with with a very interesting bent. And and I think what what you've been posting about is very similar to what I have been talking. And that that, that is this idea that we are fundamentally uh, beings of light. So uh, there's deeply encoded um, physiological adaptions and pathways in our body that speak to our, our physiology, ph- physiology's use of light um, in health. So uh, I'm really excited to do a deep dive with you uh, on around these topics, uh, but maybe we could just start by giving the listener a bit of uh, background about yourself. Yeah, so uh, I come from a more unconventional background, let's say, um, you know, I'm, I don't have any conventional certifications or degrees to my name. Um, I've been purely driven by obsession ever since around 2015 when my father passed of heart disease. So, um, you know, considering that heart disease is the global, the leading global killer, um, that's something that really pushed me into an area of health in an area of obsession to, uh, to really figure this stuff out at the fundamental level. And uh, I've been very grateful because it's allowed me to follow this path of helping people through my coaching, um, you know, wh- whether it's online, whether it's in person. And really, I, I guess I just have the, um, the the bug bit me, so to speak. Like, I just have the obsession to go as deep as possible. And and really, I do think it's a, a, a lifelong journey for me, as, as I'm sure it is for you as well. Yeah, and that, that curiosity is something that I respect immensely. And I, I think in this modern day where we have got so many competing narratives and there's so many interpretations of the scientific literature by different people by different organizations that might all have uh, different interests I, I respect anyone who really applies their knowledge and their um, intellectual horsepower to really try to work out what's going on and uh, that's what I think you've done um, and you continue to do so it's it's great to see so so let's let's dive in and and talk about this idea of a non-visual photoreceptor system. Uh, it's a bit of a mouthful. It sounds a, a, a quite a obscure or esoteric concept. Um, but why don't you give us an overview of how you think about this, this system? Sure. So I, I like to think about it in a very simplistic manner. Um, these are so non-visual photoreceptors are just uh, light sensitive proteins that absorb specific wavelengths of light. So a few, I think three of the most important ones that come to mind are melanopsin, which is inherently a blue light detector. Um, you have neuropsin, which is inherently a UVA light detector. And then you have um, rhodopsin, which uh, I believe detects green and is more oriented around low light environments. So just the very fact that we have these opsins within our system that are designed to take in natural light from the sun, uh, I think that has huge implications for not only centralized, but decentralized medicine and really how we approach chronic disease. Because in my opinion, the eye is the gateway to not only the brain, but the entire system as a whole. And once we can figure out how to orient our our light environment in a way that is um, fundamentally aligned with that non-visual photoreceptor system, then I think we can see some very excellent results in terms of metabolic health and and just uh, remission of chronic disease as well. Yeah, and and people, the way I also like to frame it for people is, you know, everyone can understand this idea of uh, proteins that help us form images, and everyone knows that because that that's obviously what the eye is for. It can show us that you've got a tiger, you know, about to, you know, rip your head off. You've got, you can see the tree, you can yeah. see your child, but and people, I don't think realize that that there's that these photoreceptors are also present and to to simply detect the specific wavelengths of light um as you've as you've talked about and the the melanopsin one i think that's a a good place to start because people it it was the first one that was discovered and and what i like to uh remind people is that the way it was discovered or one of the the kind of interesting scientific uh prompts for its discovery was that people who um certain blind people were still able to sleep at the right times. So it, it, it basically 
um, raised this question about so what was what was able what was allowing them to respond to circadian cues so that they go to the right t- go to sleep at the right time if they couldn't see anything so uh, th- that I guess maybe we could go into that and, and talk about the history of the melanopsin and, and then maybe why it's so important. Yeah, well, you know, as I mentioned, I mean, just the very fact that you shared right there is astonishing. The, the idea that blind people can um, can entrain their circadian systems in a proper way, even though they can't see visually. Um, melanopsin is, you know, it, it's found all throughout the body, but a few of the places, of course, the eye, the subcutaneous fat, which um, which Uncle Jack has, has shown recently um, through his research. Um, I believe some other places as well, the skin. So you blood find vessels. this- blood vessels, which is, has huge implications for cardiovascular disease and in all sorts of um, other conditions. Um, but the, the mere nature of melanopsin sensing blue light from the sun is, is a very key point, because I always like to make this distinction between art, artificial blue light that's inherently toxic and natural blue light from the sun. That's, I think, a, a big area of confusion for people. But, um, you know, once you understand that it is a blue light detector, then you can uh, you can create a lifestyle around protecting yourself from artificial light, and then uh, making sure that you maximize natural blue light within the day as well. Yeah, and and that that distinction I don't think many people are making, and not they're not realizing that what we're getting from uh, LED downlights from screens is fundamentally different to the the blue light that's present uh, naturally. So maybe talk about uh, how you think about that that distinction. Yeah. Well, I mean, that distinction, I think, um, like I said, it's one of the most misunderstood ones, but it it really does come down to the fact that we just have to get more natural light from the sun. And and what a lot of people don't think about is that the sun is a perfectly balanced um, package of light wavelengths. So every single light wavelength is meant to balance the others. Um, and, And that's what I find kind of disingenuous when people refer to studies that show that UVA or UVB causes skin cancer in, uh, in nocturnal, nocturnal animals, things of that nature. Um, but really, is, it's just about maximizing sunlight and, and protecting yourself from artificial light. And that's something that I go great length, uh, go to a great length for, um, especially when it comes to things like building melanin. I mean, th- there's a lot to the conversation, but that's, uh, that's really how I think about it. A really simple way, because the way I, I translate that to clients is in a simple manner. Like all the scientific jargon and, and you know, the intricacies, that stuff doesn't really appeal to the masses in my opinion, and it doesn't work because most people just throw it out. If you give them the practical action steps, I think that's more helpful and from, from my perspective at least. Yeah, one, one way I like, I've, I've uh, described it in the past is, you know, imagine the blue light that you're getting from your LED as the, the meth, the methamphetamine of light. And I, I say that because it's yes, essen- essentially distilled and refined and highly, highly processed. And whereas the, the, the blue light you're getting from the sun is, balanced by um, UV during the day um, at certain times is balanced by red and infrared when you when you're simply uh, under those blue lights uh, you you're only getting uh, you know a, a pure kind of meth hit of, uh, of blue and it's it's highly stimulatory and and highly um, highly destructive to to these melanopsin uh, receptors yeah. Yeah, highly, highly destructive. And and also um, on a fundamental like cellular level, the way it interacts with the mitochondria, the way it destroys the the uh, ATPase na- biological nanomotors. I mean, this is these are not small matters. And I think it's um, on the education part in terms of what we have to do is, is just explain this in a simple manner for people who are not aware, because when when the average person hears that, you know, artificial light is toxic. It, it's abstract. They don't really understand what they what that means because they don't have a, a fundamental grasp of physiology or biology, um, especially when it comes to mitochondrial function as well. Yeah, and and maybe let's talk about these specific functions of melanopsin. And and maybe I'll start with uh, one that people can really relate to, and that is the pupillary light reflex. So if you you know you hit your head unfortunately, or you've um, and you go into the emergency department, and the the doctor the eye doctor is shining a light in your eye. The it's actually melanopsin that are that's present in those specific retinal ganglion cells um, that is transferring is is being received the message and then is is transferring that message to um to the rest of your your brain 
uh, to enable that uh, reflex. So, so what else is melanopsin doing maybe in the eye and then in the other sites that we talked about? Um, well, I, I, I believe that melanopsin has a, a really key function. I mean, of course, you can't separate all of the opsins within the eye. They're, they're all one system. So they, they play um, a multi, you know, they, they run along the same lines typically. But it definitely has a stimulatory effect with blue light, as you mentioned. So um, that's why getting up and exposing yourself to early AM sunlight is so important, um, along with the other light wavelengths. So it allows you to, to kickstart your, your circadian biological system and, and just get ready for the day so that other hormones, other neurotransmitters, um, they're able to function properly and, and you, you get benefit out of that. Um, in terms of the, the blood vessels, I think, you know, this is something I haven't dived too deep on, but I would assume that blue light has a, it does penetrate the skin to, to some degree and the impact that that has on the blood vessels is, is just a positive one in terms of making sure that blood flow runs more efficiently. Um, I've done more research on cardiovascular function and easy water and how easy water might potentially coat and protect the blood vessels. Um, so th those are just a few things that come to mind. Yeah, no, that, that's good. And uh, yeah, I, I read that recent paper or well, was in 2017 when they discovered that the melanopsin was in the, the, uh, in these blood vessels and it was, it's mediating what's known as photo relaxation. So what that sounds like to me is that when we're outside, when we're getting uh, natural sunlight in the form of blue light, then it's allowing those blood vessels to dilate. It's allowing, um, you know, optimal blood flow to occur. And um, you could just imagine that when you're under um, an artificial light, and I'm not sure exactly, maybe you know, um, Zaid, if you're constantly stim stimulating those melanopsin receptors um, or you're destroying them with the artificial blue light, then what is that doing to to the body's ability to um, to vaso vaso uh, dilate? I, I'm 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 not sure. That's uh, that's kind of open yeah. for for debate. Yeah, it's an interesting question. So I think um, you know, blue light, natural blue light from the sun in combination with UV light, we know that 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 combination stimulates nitric oxide within the skin, that leads to the blood vessels. So my hunch is that toxic artificial light not only um, not only causes a vasoconstriction of the blood vessels, so it uh, it doesn't allow for efficient blood flow. Um, I think it also dis destroys the uh, the function of easy water, structured water, so to speak, within those blood vessels. And so, you know, once once you destroy that, and then you get into glycocalyx dysfunction, um, endothelium dysfunction, that's um, I think that's just a recipe for disaster. And considering that most people are under blue artificial blue light twenty four seven, now we can start to see one of the big reasons why cardiovascular disease is the leading global killer. Yeah, no, that that's a great point, and. The there's so many ways that sunlight is regulating endovascular uh, health and endothelial health, and you've mentioned um, the promotion of that exclusion zone water. That is something that most um, doctors, most cardiologists, have no concept of. And uh, I think one of the and I and I tweeted about this recently. So the the, the idea for to really um, summarize it for the listener is that along hydrophilic surfaces and along biological surfaces, we form this exclusion zone water, which is um, a change in the physical property of water that ex essentially excludes um, all, all solutes. And, and work by Stephen Hussey, he did an excellent um, presentation about this, showed that um, basically anything bigger than a potassium ion is not able to penetrate um, exclusion zone water. So the idea that um, you know lipoproteins like LDL can somehow magically a teleport from the lumen of the vessel uh, into the uh, and into the subendothelial space in a healthy person. It just doesn't make sense uh, at, at all to me. Yeah, I mean, and and to think about like to think about cardiovascular disease from that perspective is really game changer because it really throws out a lot of the centralized ideas in regards to what causes cardiovascular disease. Of course, they have some things right, but. Um, I, I do really think it's it's enlightened me to view cardiovascular disease from that perspective because my father passed from it. So I've always been on the hunt for, you know, that that fundamental function that once it goes AWOL, once it, it becomes dysfunctional, then that leads to a whole cascade, which which leads to like heart attacks and, and strokes and, and all those sort of th sort of things. Yeah, I'll, I'll make a couple more points just on on the melanopsin before we move on. And 
uh, I guess the the way I want people to think about it, and I, and I mentioned this in my optimal circadian health course, is that these um, these pro- proteins, these light sensitive proteins, are there for circadian entrainment, meaning they're there to help inform your body uh, about time of day. And just like we've got that um, that central clock in the hypothalamus, you've got all these other clocks that exist in in all your other organs. You've got seventy percent of your genome is is regulated by um, circadian um, timing mechanisms. So I, I really feel like the one way of thinking about this is the body has evolved this spectacular way of gathering light information so it can time this exquisitely complicated mechanism and organism with the, the most fidelity uh, as possible. And when you confuse those signals by essentially spamming the melanopsin uh, in your skin and your eyes, you know, 18 hours a day with isolated blue light. And, you know, that that is a problem on a very, very fundamental uh, cellular, subcellular level. Yeah. Yeah, purely because it just dysregulates circadian biology. I mean, w- once you go against that that evolutionary fundamental, then, you know, everything is on the table in terms of chronic disease and dysfunction. So um, I, th- I think that's a very important point to, to mention. And then... Um, also, one thing that I, I do want to mention with all of the opsins in general is that they're tied directly to the vitamin A cycle. So they're tied to um, 11 cis ret- retinol, and you know once you once you destroy the vitamin A cycle through artificial light, which is very common through throughout society, I mean you, you can lead to some some serious downstream effects there. Yeah, and and look that that is kind of the one reason why. Uh, well, Dr. Jack Cruz is talking about the harm of, of blue light is this idea that we're destroying melanopsin. It's basically liberating uh, vitamin A from this retinol from its binding uh, to, to, to these pho- non-visual photoreceptors and that that is having da- a downstream uh, cascade and, and generating um, meta- uh, mitochondrial dysfunction. So that, that kind of gets a bit technical, but that's that is a, a it's it's a very interesting and groundbreaking concept that you know no, no one I believe no, no one else is really um, addressing. Yeah, um, I actually have a question for you. Do you know? Of course, a lot of parts within the body are able to regenerate. Do you know if non-visual photoreceptors specifically are able to regenerate if you if you take a circadian friendly approach? Well, I think that's that's the key point about why. Um, this whole 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 system is is derailing so badly is because it's the longer wavelength light, the infrared um, and the red, that uh, regenerates the the melanopsin and other non visual photoreceptors. So if if we take a holistic view and we imagine that we're on the savanna or you know uh, in our ancestral past, we would have had that early morning red and infrared, as you know, we would have hit all the different um, wavelengths of UV, and then that would have faded. So you know, we've stimulated melanopsin during the middle of the day. Um, obviously, when when red uh, when blue light is its brightest, but then later in the day, that whole process um, is a, is enabling uh, the, the, these non visual photoreceptors to to repair uh, and regenerate. And then I think that the clincher is is the, the light at night because yeah. if we're not getting any uh, darkness, any true darkness because of light pollution, and we're continuing to stimulate them, then I think that's a kind of another whammy in terms of um, preventing them from regenerating them and damaging them. Yeah. And I, I assume melatonin definitely has a big part to play in terms of its antioxidant capabilities um, w- with that regeneration, correct? Yeah. Yeah, I believe so. Um, so, so that's, that's, that's talking about melan- melanopsin really. Um, that's good. And, and in terms of actionable advice, I, uh, you know, in my course, I say you basically have to cover up and I, and I post a photo of a, uh, I don't, for all the Star Wars fans out there, it's a photo of um, the Sand People in in the in the first uh, Star Wars movie, and they're basically covered up completely. And essentially, that's what we want to be doing because uh, not only um, is that melanopsin uh, in our skin, in our um, blood vessels, as we talked about, uh, in our eyes, but it's also in the fat tissue. And and that was that other um, paper when they discovered that there was melanopsin in the adipocyte, in the subcutaneous white uh, fat tissue. That is another reason how metabolic health can be implicated if we're constantly under, uh, could be deranged if we're constantly under artificial blue light. 
Yeah. And I'd also like to cover the opposite end of the spectrum as well with natural blue light. So a while back, I wrote a thread. Um, I found some research showing that I believe natural, natural blue light actually makes um, your adipocytes, your fat cells smaller in size, and it actually increases the rate of um, fat burning within those adipocytes. So that, that's another reason why I've come across a lot of people who have reported that, you know, after sunbathing consistently, not only do they look leaner, but from a physiological standpoint, they actually are leaner. So it's interesting to see this dichotomy between toxic artificial blue light and natural blue light from the sun. Yeah, look, I love you that you brought that up because it gets to this idea about personal fat threshold. And within kind of metabolic medicine, within low carb medicine, it's this this idea is that when we reach this arbitrary um, personal fat threshold, then we start depositing fat ectopically, you know, within the abdominal cavity in, in visceral white adipose, but then also within organs, like within the liver, within, within, um, the muscle. So, so what I think the limitation of this approach is that it doesn't give us enough, um, clarity about the factors that are influencing this personal fat threshold. And, you know, researchers like Tucker Goodrich have done a great job at showing that, uh, some of the, the linoleic acid breakdown products can, um, can influence that personal fat threshold. And, and obviously I, I've talked to Laszlo Boros recently, and he, um, really makes a strong case that it's actually the deuterium in the seed oils that are, uh, mm -hmm. are really causing basically a, a, what's known as a, uh, macromolecular crowding in the, in the cell. And you basically get an energy excess and the mitochondria start failing. But the, the reason why what you've talked about is important is because it speaks to this idea that light is influencing our fat, our personal fat threshold. And, light is influencing the adipocyte um, pathophysiology. So not only, um, you know, these inherent, uh, inherent personal genetic factors, not only dietary factors, but our light environment is going to dictate whether those cells uh, are simply uh, hy hyperplate, like developing larger size or or uh, and then potentially spilling over all in inflammatory compounds, or if they're able to um, replicate or maintain a, a more healthy size. So yeah, I, I'm really glad you, you brought that up. Have you noticed that you, you, you've empirically noticed that when you put your clients in the sun, that their weight loss improves? Oh, substantially. Um, and, and it's not something that I was particularly looking for as well until after I started getting reports from some of my clients and not even people who are clients, just people who followed some of my advice on sunbathing and, and doing that properly. Um, but, but that led me down that rabbit hole and I'm very grateful for it because to me, that was, I mean, that was an astonishing fact, just the idea that you could get leaner, um, and, and, you know, reduce body fat to a certain degree, just with sunbathing and light that, I mean, that's just astonishing in my, from my perspective, which is why I also put light, um, above nutrition, because I think there are other factors involved. I still think nutrition is important, but, um, that goes to show that in my opinion, I think light is just the most fundamental aspect of this game. Yeah, let, let's let's riff on this for a moment because um, what we're discussing is why you know Dr. Jack Cruz has put um, food before, sorry, sun before food. Why you've just mentioned the same, um, and I will mention a quick mouse study that basically shows the opposite of what you talked about, and that was um, a study where they had a six month period of two groups of mice. One were fed, uh, they're both, they're both fed the same diet, but one was on a shift work schedule. So chronic circadian disruption and with the exact same diet, this, the circadian disrupted mice had, um, hyperplasia, uh, sorry. Um, they had hypertrophy of their adipocytes. So again, not non-ideal responses. Uh, they had a fibrosis. They had, um, raised inflammatory markers in that that fat tissue and they were insulin resistant so that that shows i know it's a it's a mouse study but it gives us a really good uh, proof of concept of this idea that it's not just the food that you're eating it's the actual light environment that you're eating that food in that can potentially uh influence your metabolic health the the other thing that i want maybe you can talk about is uh, and i think this is central to this idea of um, weight regulation and sunlight is the POMC system mm. Yeah, this this one, I think um, the, the two most fascinating systems, in my opinion, are non-visual photoreceptor system and, and POMC in general. So um, every every mammal has something called the POMC gene, um, and that leads to a protein called pro, uh, POMC as well, pro-opio-melanocortin. And essentially, this protein is fundamentally stimulated by natural light. 
And it's also, in my opinion, stimulated by artificial light. So just light in general. But when you stimulate this, let's say you stimulate it through sunlight, the ideal way, circadian friendly way, then this protein has about maybe seven or eight um, uh, biological peptides that are cleaved to this protein. So you have things like alpha, beta, gamma, um, MSH, melanocyte stimulating hormone. You have ACTH, these are just abbreviations. You have CLIP. Um, what are the beta endorphin is a huge one, an opioid peptide. So just from this mere fact that light stimulates all of these peptides that are some of the most powerful ones in nature, I think that has huge implications for um, not only the, the clinicians out there, but for even decentralized health coaches or, or people who are in this work. Yeah, and and, and the, the centrality of POMC to uh, the organism's physiology, I don't think it can be understated because as you mentioned, uh, I mean, ACTH is um, is produced in the pituitary gland and then uh, goes down and signals the adrenal cortex to make cortisol. So, you know, the a funda one of the most fundamental um, uh, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, that's one of the most fundamental pathways in the body is, you know, it's a cleavage product of POMC. And, you know, obviously we know that uh, high, having persistently high cortisol will push your blood sugar up. And that is the effect of cortisol. It's a glucocorticoid, you know, gluco means gl glucose. So w why people get a, you know, a spike of your blood glucose in the morning is because you've got a natural uh, cortisol rise. So cortisol is liberating. It's, it's promoting gluconeogenesis. It's liberating energy. So um, if you're stimulating POMC in the wrong way, then uh, of course you're going to be um, dysregulating uh, glucose metabolism. Um, so I, I think that's a, a, a really important point. Yeah. And not only through ACTH as well. So you're raising cortisol through that mechanism. You're also raising, raising insulin um, through CLIP as well, because CLIP is an insulin secretagogue, if I have that correct. So um, it, it stimulates uh, insulin production from the pancreas. And once you have that, you know, that two, uh, two way punch, so to speak from artificial light, then um, I, I think that can set up problems for people who have, um, you know, type two diabetes and other metabolic dysfunction. Yeah. And, and I really, uh, you know, Uncle Jack, Jack Cruz basically said that on my podcast about, you know, almost six months ago. And I've really done, did my, done my best to kind of verify um, this with, with my own reading. I haven't found a lot about a clip other than um, some very, very old papers. Uh, it, it, his, his point and is that basically the artificial light is hijacking POMC. So just as um, a natural ultraviolet light is going to mm. give us the correct or physiological expression of the POMC um, um, peptide hormones in a way that um, optimizes our physiology. When we're constantly under blue light and we're use, having a dysregulated light environment, then it's essentially hijacking this gene to um, turn up turn up our blood glucose, um, promote hyperinsulinemia all, all, all around. If someone, um, but if someone has more information on that, like I'd, I'd be very willing to uh, to look in. But it, it makes sense to me the. Uh, that that is um, what's happening. The the other ways of let's let's also talk about how sunlight could potentially um, uh, act as a very very strong signal to reduce eating because you've mentioned uh, beta endorphin and you mentioned alpha MSH and I wanted to make the point that the pharmaceutical industry knows how critical the POM C system is to appetite regulation and that started when they they first that leptin hormone was discovered and they they realized that leptin which was made in that fat cells that we've just talked about before is actually signaling all the way up to the hypothalamus and um, binding to receptors on those POMC neurons to inform the body about the energy state so so they knew about that and they still do and they were designing design medications and one of them is called uh, what uh, bupropion uh, naltrexone it's a combination uh, and that particular drug was designed to uh, basically stop a negative feedback loop um, by blocking the effect of beta endorphin to kind of reduce uh, people, potentiate the effect of alpha MSH and reduce people's eating. So th they're aware that this is an incredibly powerful system to, to regulate appetite. But what they don't tell you is that um, you can stimulate alpha MSH to reduce your appetite by getting out and getting ultraviolet light. Yeah. Yeah. And I believe like, I mean, generally most of those peptides are appetite suppressants. So you don't only have like one or two working in your favor on that end. 
you have almost all of them working in your favor. Um, and I, I just think that it, it goes against mainstream orthodoxy because this idea that sunlight can can suppress appetite and influence leptin in such a way that it can improve your your metabolic function if you are in a in a more negative relationship with food um, that just goes against everything that mainstream centralized medicine has to offer and i think the difficulty is in trying to explain that to mainstream practitioners especially yeah so i mean when it comes to, to POMC and, and all of the peptides that our, uh, our appetite regulators. I think this just goes to show that we um, we really have an uphill battle, to say the least, in terms of translating this work into not only the understanding of everyday people, but the understanding of centralized practitioners. Um, and, and just the fact that centralized medicine is embedded in bed, so to speak, with big, far, big pharma and big food, that just makes it more difficult. But I think we're doing a good job on within you know, our little decentralized realm online and, and translating that into to people getting results. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I really want to l make a really strong point for the listener and kind of do it, do a, a, a checkpoint here. And what we what the implication of what we're talking about is that if you regulate your circadian biology, if you stimulate POMC in your uh, eye, in your central nervous system, in your skin, um, then you will lose and your your white fat tissue you will lose weight and you will become leptin sensitive and you will become metabolically healthy and the idea that insulin resistance and what essentially mitochondrial dysfunction is at the root of all these chronic diseases is that what that means is that we're you, you, you're not a customer anymore for um, an industry that is built on on people being sick and you know, I, I made this point to a to a previous guest, and I, I've seen the, the degree to which uh, one person can be dependent on on a medical system, and it is very sad. But you can just take someone with end stage uh, type two diabetes, um, and and the amount of resources and medical care they require. So they have got um, end stage kidney disease, so they might be on dialysis because they've got um, such severe di diabetic nephropathy. They have um, got diabetic ne uh, retinopathy. They're potentially blind or vision impaired, uh, so they're not able to drive themselves anymore. They um, might have uh, severe per peripheral vascul vascular disease. They might have diabetic ulcers, so they might be having um, you know, vascular bypass surgery to maintain use and function of, the of their legs. Uh, they... And, and then they have these macrovascular complications. So they might have had a stroke. Um, they might be um, they, they they might have had um, previous uh, AMIs, heart attacks. So and the list of medications that 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 someone with this condition is on is they're on a statin, they're on blood pressure medication, they're on uh, multiple oral uh, hypoglycemics, they're on injected insulin. So all that to say, it's a massive resource um and uh, effort that needs to care for someone like that and um what Zaid and, and i discussing is that if we're regulating our circadian biology none of that a, a lot of that could potentially be avoided i i firmly believe it too i mean just think about how much money especially like specifically where i am in the u.s we spend on healthcare. It, it is an astonishing amount i mean we're talking about billions of dollars maybe even trillions i don't know but um I think this this just goes to show that if we can educate people the proper way and really get that that light bulb um, flicked on, then we can take people from a more centralized paradigm to a decentralized one. And the ultimate goal for all of us is to just be in a healthy state of of living, just to be healthy in general, so that we can enjoy life and you know um, make the best of it. But I, th I think that's a very important point. Just all the medications and and all the other um, complications that stem from insulin resistance specifically. Yeah, and and maybe we can talk about this narr the the kind of prevailing narratives around the sun because if if people are accepting what we're talking about, which is that there is an amazing health benefit to be had from uh, sun exposure and from regulated circadian biology, then we we really need to address kind of the the sticking points and the resistances that people might have to that. And the interesting point that uh, I'll also make is that that same compound alpha MSH that um, regulates appetite in your hypothalamus and your brain, it is the same compound that is uh, influencing skin darkening. So, and, and therefore um, melanin synthesis in your keratinocytes in your skin. So 
uh, I think that is a really elegant explanation of how central UV light is to body weight regulation is that it's the same compound, the same string of amino acids in a, in a different place is tanning your skin and making melanin as is stopping you eating. I think, um, you know, that says, that says a lot, that says a, a, an amazing amount, but, um, you know, the dermat your dermatologist is not able to describe, uh, not that I'm aware, I haven't met one that's able to, to describe the, the leptin, melanocortin pathway or POMC in a way, uh, that, that makes that clear. So maybe Zay, you can talk about, uh, the, the, the role or the role of the sun that, and how we can use it safely. Yeah. Well, there, there are definitely a lot of misconceptions out there. And I think, um, I really enjoy being at the front, you know, being at the front line, so to speak, in terms of like tackling these bad ideas in regards to sunlight, because there are a lot of them. And unfortunately, a lot of the board certified ophthalmologists and uh, dermatologists are pushing these ideas. Even the Skin Cancer Foundation in the States um, is, is pushing the idea that there's no such thing as a safe tan. And knowing what we know, that's just an absurd statement based off of first principles thinking, because not only like UVA and UVB, for example, are the two centralized boogeymen that a lot of people um, say you should avoid, say you should practice set avoidance around. But like we mentioned, UVA stimulates nitric oxide production. Um, it also plays a role in, in other physiological functions. UVB is the very light wavelength that's responsible for uh, stimulating vitamin D3 production. So how you know, where is the, um, like, where's the silver lining here? How does it make sense that centralized medicine demonizes the sun UVB specifically in terms of vitamin D3 production, but it, it hails vitamin D3 as a super, um, hormone. So you know, I, I just think there's a disconnect there. And in terms of like melanin, for example, a lot of people have this idea that melanin, once you start to get dark, then that's where you should stop sunbathing. That means you've had enough, so to speak, because if you go above that, you have potential toxicity. But I think that idea is absurd because in my opinion, knowing what we know with melanin, the fact that it um, disassociates the water molecule, it's responsible for human photometabolism, it's anti-venom, anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, the list goes on. Um, I think once you get a tan and all people of all skin types can get a tan, then that, um, that really leaves the door wide open for more sunbathing. So like everything, almost everything in centralized medicine, the idea that they're pushing is fundamentally wrong. And it's the opposite of what they're saying that, um, that is more correct. And, and, in, and I, yeah. yeah, go on, go on. Oh, I mean, I was just going to go on a tangent about like healthy sunbathing practices and stuff like that, but that's a little bit of a rabbit hole. Yeah. I, I wanted to make the point that it's, it's a logical inconsistency. And, and I, as you said, I like to, um, similar to you, I like to think things from first principles. So if we have an undeniable, unarguable biological need for ultraviolet light uh, for those pathways that you've just mentioned, um, what, but yet it is killing us, how much should we get? I mean, th th this is the kind of cognitive dissonance that we're all asked to engage in um, where if we're following these, uh, you know, UV, complete UV avoidance narratives, which is, so 20 minutes, 10 minutes, I mean, wh wh where is that? It's, it's just an arbitrary um, construct. There's no, there's no um, solid uh, scientific or um, reason if, if to, to rip ba basically um, along that line of reasoning. So what, what I would really encourage people to think about is that there, there is obviously a disconnect here and how it, the same thing that is giving us life can't also be giving us disease and it might be the case that what how we're using the sunlight is the, the key point and how what the lifestyle is of people today and um, is perhaps contributing to to uh their their disease their skin cancer melanoma rather than the sun inherently or rather than the sun used in an ancestral context absolutely absolutely 100% um it's it's definitely the lifestyle around light i mean just the fact that people take these recommendations and they they practice sun avoidance that's a big part of the discussion um being under artificial light 24/7 that's a huge part of the discussion as well and then other finer things that not a lot of people are aware of like sunglasses contact lenses sunscreen um even just being clothed up and not intentionally sunbathing with most of your skin in the game that's um that's a, a big factor as well. So 
I think in general, like any, any, um, conventional prescription of like 10, 15, 20 minutes of sunlight, you can throw that out the window because it is all an individual game. What we need to understand is that all mammals, all human beings specifically can develop their melanin. And I've seen this time and time again, I've, I've, I, I literally have hundreds of comments on Twitter from people who are like, you know, I'm a redhead. My daughter's a redhead. We've practiced early AM sunlight exposure for filigree production. And then we've really dosed ourselves up in a way with midday sunlight to not burn at all and to gain all of its benefits. Um, and uh, also like the, this concept of the solar callus is absolutely huge. Like I, I analogize it to just approaching the gym. Like nobody would go into the gym and try to squat 250 pounds when they have no gym experience. Like it's absurd. And so I, I try to teach people that you have to approach sunlight exposure the same way. And then eventually you will get to a point, no matter what your skin type is, to where you can spend five, six, seven hours in the sun without any problems whatsoever. Yeah, and, and great points. And, and I'll add some nuances here, which I always uh, make when we're discussing deliberate sun exposure. And that is if you're taking photosensitizing medications, uh, which include uh, medications like isotretinoin, like the antibiotic doxycycline, uh, like a whole bunch of other medications, then you really you can't you can't be doing deliberate sun exposure. Um, this also includes immunosuppressing medications. So if you're on high dose of um, glucocorticoids, uh, if you're on medications for uh, to specifically prevent transplant rejection, um, or biologic agents, all these where you're modulating your immune system, you're essentially pharma pharmacologically dis. Uh, messing with your body's ability to deal with the hormetic stress that is the sun. So I want to really caveat that. And if you are on these type of medications, then deliberate sun exposure is not going to be for you. Um, and I, I would encourage you to hopefully work on or address the lifestyle causes of whatever's going on so you can move past uh, and then get, get some deliberate uh, UV exposure. But prior to that UV A rise um, is the red and infrared. That is safe and that is going to be safe for everyone. And that's going to be even safe for people with red hair because um, another point is that uh, people with red hair do have a high risk of malignant melanoma. So, um, but if we if we understand the different wavelengths of light, if we can look at and, and, and conceptualize that different wavelengths of sunlight appear at different times, then we can really tailor the, the um, approach to uh, allow people to gain benefit of natural sunlight um, without, and um, perhaps if they're specially medicated, as I've mentioned, without um, putting them potentially at risk of uh, UV damage if they're not ready to, you know, lift the 200 kilo uh, barbell, as you mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that is the nuance there that I didn't even know about the, um, the photosensitive medication. So that's an excellent point. But um, this idea of atrophic skin and just having unadapted, weak and dysfunctional skin because of the lifestyle factors that's the foundation of, of all of this. And I think it's, um, it's important to understand that UV does technically damage your skin, but your body has, um, your body is infinitely wise in its ability to respond to a hormetic stressor and get stronger as a result, assuming you do the right things around lifestyle. So um, it's, I mean, you're speaking my language. That's, that's hundred percent there. Yeah, and and great point, Zaid, because no one, neither of us are suggesting that UVA isn't carcinogenic or UVB doesn't have the potential to be carcinogenic, and um, that that is unequivocal. And um, what what both of us are saying is that if it's used um, correctly, if the body's um, hormetic uh, ability is preserved, then that is not going to be injurious to the to the organism and. It involves doing everything that, that we've mentioned. It involves getting that early morning uh, red and infrared first to precondition the skin. It involves building up this idea of, of a solar callus. So there's um, there's proper ways of doing it and there's improper ways of doing it. And, uh, you know, I, I like to draw an analogy to this, this um, the cholesterol and heart disease because um, the, the, the pr predominant narrative within cardiology and preventative cardiology is that and um, you know any level of uh, LDL total cholesterol apoB um, beyond a very strict arbitrary cutoff is you know is depositing a plaque in the arteries and there is no allowance or nuance in that argument for a situation where 
we can safely have, um, you know, a higher LDL or higher ApoB. Um, and it really ignores all that other evidence that includes things like people living longer with a, with higher uh, LDL facts of um, of uh, immune function that the LDL particle has, the fact that it's traffic energy, fat soluble vitamins, all that gets thrown out the window. And I, I think that that analogy holds in, in centralized dermatology and this discussion around the sun, because we're basically throwing out all the benefits of UV light exposure, including the nitric oxide, including the POMC, um, including the vitamin D production. And um, when we're telling people to put UV blocking sunscreens on um, all day to cover up, uh, you know, and and do everything that you've just that you mentioned in in this this advice. Yeah, yeah, and it's extremely damaging to society as a whole. It's only making um you know the state of our health worse on an individual and societal level. And I think it's extremely sad, which is why um it, it's important for us to tackle these ideas head on because we just have no room for them. It, it's there are archaic ideas led by a system that is just not catching up to to what the evidence provides. Yeah, and before before we move on, and I want to talk about melanin next. I just want to uh, read out a, a couple lines of a paper, and I am not the first person to uh, reach for epidemiology, and I think that the it inherently has a range of flaws. But when we're looking at a hard endpoint like mortality, then um, it can be it's it's much much higher quality. And I, I just want to quickly read out for the listeners. This study is called Higher Ultraviolet Light Exposure is Associated with Lower Mortality, an analysis of the UK Biobank cohort study. So this is, this paper was um, was published in, uh, what year was it published in? Uh, doesn't make, it doesn't make mention exactly when it was published, but I'm just going to read the, um, the, the conclusion out for you because I think this really sums up uh, very elegantly, uh, in, in in unequivocally, what we talk, what Zaid and I have been talking from a mechanistic point of view. So the discussion says we find that the UK biobank participants with more active sun seeking behaviours and who lived at lower at latitudes with a higher average UV exposure have a lower risk of all cause cardiovascular disease and cancer mortality. These results are consistent for ve- two very t- different types of exposure suggesting uh, that it is UV exposure and not an unmeasured variable that leads to the lower mortality risk. And and they go on to say that these results add to the growing literature suggesting that UV exposure is associated with lower mortality risk. And it lists a whole um, bunch of other papers. So this is the kind of, this is the square that, this is the question we need to ask to to. Uh, people who are trying to tell uh, tell us to avoid the sunlight. Um, that is a pretty uh, unequivocal, pretty obvious in, uh, finding that you're going to live uh, longer. You're going to get less uh, cancer and cardiovascular disease if you have a uh, deliberate sun-seeking uh, exposure. Yeah. Yeah. And I've come across a lot of research in terms of like uh, the farther you go from the equator, the the higher incidence of cancer and all these other chronic diseases out uh, that, that you um, you expose yourself to. And I think it just makes sense from an evolutionary perspective because we evolved in the the cradle of civilization, so to speak, around the equator. So, you know, it it was only thousands of years after that, which we traveled to higher latitude areas. And then we set ourselves up in those little, little camps, so to speak. But that that just, in my opinion, I I think it just makes sense, especially knowing all the mechanistic things that we do. Yeah. Uh, And to cap this off and and one more very interesting point, it says participants with more sun active sun seeking behavior also had lower crude mortality from skin cancer <laughs> from skin <laughs> cancer so you know you can get you, you're still going to live longer even if uh you 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 developing these skin cancers um so uh and an inverse relationship between solar uv exposure and cancer mortality so it's in terms of living longer which is you know the goal of your clients which is the goal of my uh, my clients, my patients, um, this is what we, we want to do. And, and it's, it's pretty obvious that UV light is part of that. Let, let's talk about melanin because um, what you talked about, just mentioned earlier, is that you, everyone's told to get to the point or, or the, cent, the centralized um, advice is even tanning is a problem. But you've described a couple of functions of melanin and I think it, it, it bears out a little bit more, deserves a bit more discussion about the benefits of melanin. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, melanin, when people think about melanin, they only think about tanning. And I think that's unfortunate because if you search through the literature, melanin is probably the most powerful polymer out there. I mean, the most, one of the most powerful compounds out there. And it makes sense from an evolutionary perspective because this is how we evolved as mammals. Um, but like I said, I mean, anti-venom in some cases, it, it responds to certain venoms um, in terms of protection. It's a powerful anti-inflammatory, powerful anti antioxidant. It, uh, it's an immune modulator. So I've even see, seen evidence that it, um, it helps with HIV patients, especially. Um, and then the, the biggest one, in my opinion, the one that I've uh, gone deeper on is the idea that melanin is melanin's relationship with light and water is central to human photometabolism, which is a foreign concept, especially to centralized medicine. But it's this idea that whenever photons strike your skin, um, through midday sun exposure and you have adequate melanin, then your, um, your body uses the photoelectric effect to, to then cleave off, um, or produce electrons, which, you know, we know has, has a very powerful effect on, on health. So, um, those are just a few of the things that come to mind, but really everybody sh should be, um, orienting their lifestyle around building more melanin because it is su it's such a powerful compound. Amazing. And there, there was work of, I believe, Dr. Herrera, who has shown that, who has done pioneering work on the evidence for the, the ability of melanin to essentially uh, allow us to derive energy from the sun. And, um, you know, listeners to my podcast will know that we, we've talked about the electron transport chain, we've talked about mitochondrial function, and how um, electrons are the input into that, uh, that uh, electron transport chain. So it's, a, it's fascinating to think that we've evolved or nature has evolved this compound that allows us to, to essentially harness solar radiation uh, to, to improve or to improve the function or to essentially derive energy. I mean, and, and I believe that he initially noticed that when he was looking at uh, the retinas of a range of people with, uh, with retinal diseases, with um, age related macular degeneration. And um, those basically where there was melanin there was less blood there were less blood vessels indicating that there was um essentially an ability for the tissue to operate um through well just by by harnessing that uh light energy through melanin so yeah me melanin has got so many um compounds and look we haven't even talked about the kind of this idea of melanin as a biological semiconductor and it's getting into into quite a deep uh realm of of quantum biology but if we're, we're really again thinking about the body as an electric being that's that's hard, that's that's running off electrons and uh, and protons, then it's it's also got this uh, function as as a biological semiconductor. So don't know if you want to make any comments about that. Uh, we're happy to keep it up more higher level for people if 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 you don't. Yeah, well, I mean, in terms of um, you know the biological semiconduction, that is certainly a deep rabbit hole that I need to explore more of. Um, especially in relation to quantum biology, but I, I would like to share that, you know, it, melanin is not just, it's not just one form of melanin. You have three forms of melanin. So you have neuromelanin in the brain, um, you know, the, the destruction of neuromelanin through various means has been implicated in potentially Parkinson's disease, dementia, a whole bunch of other neurodegenerative disorders. Um, and then you have eumelanin, which um, is responsible for the browns and blacks in nature. It's, um, it's more protective of you from UV, uh, but then you also have pheomelanin, which is responsible for the reds, uh, oranges, yellows, pinks. I mean, if you look at flamingos or like a red fox, that's an example. And this is typically what lighter skinned people have. So even in relation to melanin, people tan differently. And this is also something I want to reiterate because I feel like there's this, um, there's this unconscious like expectation that a light skinned person is supposed to tan exactly the same way as a dark skinned person, but that's not true. So I think if we can orient ourselves around these different types of melanin and then peg ourselves individually around what type we have more, more of, then we can use light in a, in a responsible way to, to maximize that type of melanin. Yeah. Great, great points. And what about, what about some takeaways for people? So they've listened to us talk about um, the health benefits of sunlight of, of in terms of their weight, in terms of um, maybe their cardiovascular disease uh, risk as well. So how, how do you approach advising people to get sun safely so that 
uh, they're not inadvertently um, doing damage. Yeah. So like we mentioned earlier, um, a huge focus on early AM sunlight. So this can be anywhere between sunrise and about, I'd say, 9 or 10 a.m., depending on where you are. Um, that is what's going to help with a skin protein known as filigrin um, that has a protective effect on the skin. There's some other um, factors that that have to do with that as well. But you're essentially just priming your skin for higher UVA and UVB conditions. Um, and, and just that alone, I've seen people experience some great results in terms of not burning, building melanin during midday, so forth. Um, outside of this, I think um, the, the sunglasses discussion, the sunglasses, sunscreen, contact lenses, there's nuance here. But uh, in general, ditch your sunglasses. Um, your, your eyes are a muscle, so you just have to get acclimated to natural lights. Um, contacts, I usually recommend that people transition to reading glasses so that it's easier to actually transition into sunlight. And then there are other things as well. You're not causing uh, hypoxia of the cornea. You're not influencing the light spectrum in a negative way. And uh, sunscreen, of course, knowing what we know about neuro neuro neuroectoderm, the fact that um, the skin of your brain, eyes, and tissue are essentially the same, then, uh, you know, just removing all sunscreen and replacing that with early AM sunlight is is a key part. And then, of course, protecting yourself from artificial light as much as possible, especially after sunset, because you want yeah. melatonin and, you know, the, the circadian mechanism to function properly. Yeah, that that's a key one. And, you know, people will real do, really do damage if they're getting off a plane jet lagged and their circadian rhythm is up the creek. Uh, and then they they, they get, get out, um, you know, from Sydney Airport, they go to Bondi Beach. And they, they pretty quickly look like a prawn. And um, so don't don't be one of those people. The the other point I wanted to make is about dietary. And, and we actually have some good evidence, even um, some randomized evidence, that increasing omega-3 uh, in the diet basically reduces photosensitivity. And there was a couple of papers in people who had some quite obscure uh, genetic photosensitivity conditions. And simply putting them on a higher omega-3 diet and this in this form of supplementation reduce their their burning and their photosensitivity what i think we can pair that with um if we're putting together the pieces of this puzzle is that people uh, burn less when they get rid of refined seed oils so when they cut down on omega-6 uh, fatty acids the refined ones from canola oil vegetable oil corn soy grapeseed cottonseed oil that they, they stop burning or they, they burn a lot less so i think Together, that speaks to this fundamental uh, uh, aspect of the fatty acid composition of our body and our skin in, in terms of influencing um, influencing our burning ability. And, and we already know that drugs can influence photosensitivity. I, I, as I mentioned, you know, doxycycline, isotretinoin, we, we advise you to avoid the sun when you're on those drugs because they influence photosensitivity. So um, any comments about uh, your dietary approach? Yeah, I mean, definitely more animal-based, um, ancestrally aligned uh, nutrition approach. I think, um, of course, you know, the vegetable oil topic has been, it's been uh, hammered on so much over, especially Twitter, and it's starting to get into mainstream as well, which is nice. But in general, just making sure that you focus on, um, you know, grass-fed, grass-finished animal fats that are low in deuterium, um, uh, sea, wild-caught seafood, I'm absolutely a big advocate of. So any shellfish as well, oyster, shrimp, um, scallops wild caught sardines, mackerel, um, that that's, you know, at the end of the day, the food that you eat and the fatty acid composition is what makes up the, the quality of your skin. So I, I think that's a very important point, but it's also important to emphasize that you don't need to cut out vegetable oils completely. The, the human body is really resilient. And I've seen clients experience great results, even when they're not so like regimented about avoiding vegetable oil. I think the most important thing is to just get those those natural omega-3 and and other foods in into your diet. Yeah, in interesting observation. Um, I think everyone will benefit from from getting uh, lower down uh, in those those uh, seed oils, but interesting that you've found that people can still get benefit um, even if they uh, don't. So that that's a fascinating and really useful takeaway for for the listener. Any any final thoughts or anything that um, you'd like to uh, mention before we wrap up? Yeah, I would just like to say. Um, you know, at the end of the day, the sun is to be respected. It's it's a double-edged sword, but I think we, we need to err on more of the side that the sun is the very thing responsible for all life on Earth. Um, we've evolved with it ever since 
uh, you know, mammals came out of, um, came into existence. And I would really like to see more people just have that curiosity to be able to look into this work that we're sharing here, because there are a lot of bad ideas that are being shared by centralized medicine. And it's unfortunate because, um, of course, there, there's corrupt influence. You have the Rockefeller inspired centralized medical system. Um, th there's a lot to it. But at the end of the day, we need to respect the sun and make sure that we approach light environment properly. Great, great advice. And I, I really would echo that. It, this is a hormetic stressor. Um, UV light is a hormetic stressor, um, which means that you need to use it wisely. You need to allow it, yourself to recover appropriately. And as we talked about, you have to prepare um, before you do any kind of deliberate um, UV light exposure. So um, I think that those caveats need to be well well um, received and not, not uh, I don't think, so people don't take out what we're saying out of context. Um, and yes, the, the end of the day, we wanna, we're doing this to help people optimize their health, um, live longer and, and prevent disease, which I think we've, we've basically uh, showed that um, the sunlight is incredibly integral to, to that. So um, Zayed, thanks for your time. Where can people find you and maybe let us know what you're, what you're offering and, and how people can engage with you? Yeah, so you can find me at um, Zaid K. Dahaj on Twitter, on Instagram as well. Same handle. I'm sure you'll have it in the, the description. Um, in terms of what I'm, I'm focused on, I've, I'm transitioning away actually from online coaching, and I'm going to work with uh, people in person within the Southern California area. So that's going to be very exciting. And uh, of course, I'm going to put light environment at the very top of this work. And uh, I really think that my, my mission now is to really educate people everyday people on on just light and how important it is and, and all the nuance associated with it so that's going to be my main focus yeah fantastic we'll include that uh information so people can can get in touch with you and yeah fo follow zaid on twitter he's got some amazing educational content which is very um very thoroughly interesting and, and well researched so thanks very much mate for coming on and uh, great to talk thanks max it's been a fun time